Hello, Daniel Holmesy, Director of the Neighbor Empowerment Network here in San Francisco. Behind us, our City Hall, where today we're gonna to host the first ever NEN Disaster Resilience Summit. One exciting piece of today's event is gonna be the conversation between Council Member Latoya Cantrell from New Orleans with Felicia Thibodeau, one of the leaders of the Resilient Bayview Initiative here in San Francisco. The goal of the conversation, for Latoya to share with Felicia all the things she knows now that she could have done before the storm struck to make sure that her recovery and her community's recovery would have been as strong and as fast and as safe as possible for the people that live there. Let's tune in right now and find out how the conversation is going. Good morning, Councilwoman Latoya Cantrell. <laughs> oh, Lord. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come and join with us. And audience, please forgive me, I'm nursing myself back to health, so I'm a little stuffy here. I heard over and over again this morning about defining resilience. I come from Bayview Hunters Point where I help to chair the vulnerable populations community under the Bayview Resilience, Resilient Bayview, excuse me. And for me, defining resilience is resiliency defines itself by those. Can you hear me? It's an echo. echo. The resiliency defines itself by those communities which are still left standing and able to get back to business in an efficient and timely manner. That defines resiliency. What do you define? How do you define resiliency? Well, I have to be honest with you, um, particularly in this uh, post-disaster recovery mode that I feel that we're still in in New Orleans, although we've made great you know, accomplishments. Um, hearing the word over and over again, I've kind of, it's, it's, it's worn me out. Because at the end of the day, when disaster hits and you have to band together with your people, and that means in your community, you are the first responders. That's one of the things that you really need to understand. It's the people you live next door to, down the street from that you will need, you will just need them in so many different ways. And that also includes um, your faith-based communities <clears throat> as well. But in terms of resiliency, I think that, you know, we are resilient people. I think Daniel mentioned his parents have been here three, gen three generations of uh, um, here in San Francisco. If, if they weren't resilient, we wouldn't be, be talking about it uh, today. So that term wears me out. I think that at the end of the, of the day, we know that we're resilient because we evolve with change. And that's what we will be called to do when disaster hits. So don't get me on that, you know. We, we are resilient. What we're doing right now and how we have bounced back from previous disasters. In 89, I was a junior in high school in Palmdale, California. So I am from California. I grew up, you know, going through the earthquake drills. I've been through earthquakes um, in the high desert um, in um, Southern California. So we're all resilient and we will continue to be. Thank you for that. And I like the way that you keep it real. It's the truth. <laughs> I know for sure that um, there have been several hurricanes in Hurricane Katrina. What would you see? What would you say were the best lessons learned after the Hurricane Katrina? Well, in regards to my work on the ground when Katrina hit, um, sum it up for you a little bit. I was the president of my neighborhood organization. I was not on the city council. wasn't trying to be on the city council. It was not in in you know what do you call it a plan of mine at all. Uh, I moved into my neighborhood of Broadmoor in 2000, and it was a community where the needs were the greatest, uh, pretty much a microcosm of the city of New Orleans demographically and social economically. So people earning from $13,000 a year to $400,000 a year, 68% um, African American, 25% Caucasian, 3% uh, Latina, you know, so 
the demographics again mirroring it. We took on six to 12 feet of water. It stayed in our community for three weeks. It's a neighborhood seven minutes from downtown. Um, you know, we, um, yeah, so just giving you a little sense of, of the community I'm talking about. Kind of shaped like a little pie, a little triangle there. And so, um, you know, when, when it hit in, in during three weeks of water, what was your question? <laughs> telling you about the because I need you you need to be able to visualize you know the community that I'm that I'm speaking of but as the leader of that community uh, pre-Katrina I had a real responsibility in the post-Katrina environment to find my people my board members for example we were displaced all over the United States and um, and from communication a way of getting together that's when we be, really began to plan because that was my question, what was the best lesson learned? So best lessons learned um, post was that I wished we would have mapped, you know, our community pre-disaster. And not just thinking about, um, you know, your assets. Well, the people at the end of the day are really your assets in your community, but the physical, your homes, but mostly the human piece. You, it, it, it doesn't get any, any bigger than that. Um, knowing where our most vulnerable people were in our community, that would have been great. Where our seniors are, disabled, even our pets, that was a huge, huge thing um, post-disaster, people losing their pets or being disconnected from them. But having a real understanding of who was in our community in order to, in that post-disaster mode, be able to determine who's coming back, where they are, mechanisms for communication, uh, social media, websites, um, solar, you know, cell phones, that sort of thing, but really understanding the, the fabric of the community. And even as a neighborhood leader, as I said, we didn't have, we didn't have our mapping in place. I didn't know where everyone was in my community, all my elderly, where the pets were. And that really would have been an asset in in uh, post-disaster mode. Had any work been done around re um, disaster re recovery pre-Katrina? No work at all. Um, again, neighborhood leader. It was not a priority. Um, we had a list of things that we were working on in the community. Uh, one <laughs> was uh, ensuring that the flood mitigation project that did happen years before in my neighborhood, that was completed pre-Katrina. We were really advocating for the landscaping to return back to the center of the community. So that was literally a priority, so no focus at all on disaster preparedness. So post Katrina and no work having been done in the future, how did you, as just a neighborhood leader, go about building disaster recovery amongst community members? I think the, the heart of it, well, first of all, um, my neighborhood was about one of seven that was recommended not to return. And there was a group of business leaders, so to speak, that were um, identified by uh, government leadership that would uh, create a plan of how the city would rebuild. And this group was called the Bring Back New Orleans Commission. And so the residents found out that our community was slated not to return by waking up and reading from your local newspaper and seeing green dots over our neighborhoods. And so one of them was Broadmoor. And I'm quoted as saying, you know, all hell broke loose because no one consulted us at all about, you know, about, about anything. And so the strength, as I think about it, was being organized pre-disaster. And what I mean by being organized is having an organization, a neighborhood, 
ours is the Broadmoor Improvement Association that was established in 1972. And, um, and I began, I think I started my presidency there, my tenure in 2004. So I had an ability through the organization to build trust within the community. And really it wasn't me. The organization already existed. It was resilient. But knowing that that trust had already been, you know, been established and the foundation laid, it really helped in the post-disaster mode for people to trust the Broadmoor Improvement Association. We were not foreign, you know, they knew us pre-disaster. So when it was time to organize, um, and I called, you know, a meeting where we had to meet, our first meeting was on a front lawn. Uh, Walter Isaacson's dad's front lawn and about 300 people showed up and this was again you know post disaster as we say but we had to rent um, heat, heating lamps tents chairs AV equipment um, you name it because all of our civic uh, facilities were destroyed but this was our way of organizing and holding a meeting. And we as a community, those 300 people who traveled in, um, we said, listen, this is about rebuilding the entire community of Broadmoor, not the certain section of the neighborhood that you know, had the greatest needs or the social ills that plagued it pre-disaster. And so the community as a whole said, hey, everyone has the right to return. And we began to adopt values that would then lead us to recovery. And one of those was that I just mentioned. Everyone has the right to return. It's not about someone, you know, a certain section being mowed down and everyone being, you know, another section being saved. It's about 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. So again, being very realistic about um, the expectations because you have to manage those expectations as you move through recovery. Um, and so having those values that we adopted post-disaster could have easily been done pre-disaster. And so I think that's what this summit is really all about here with neighborhood leaders. You are called to work with your residents to determine what, you know, what your values are. And when you're right in that mode, you know what they are already and you can hit the ground running. But those were some of the things that we had to do immediately after. I'm really excited to hear you say that because in, with Resilient Bayview, we formed our vulnerable population group, which identifies seniors, persons living with disability, pregnant women, um, and then we've also began to map out our assets, not so much only the human mm -hmm the human lives, but the assets as to how and what and where we can be, begin rebuilding as a community. We not only want to be resilient in our community, we want for our city officials and Resilient Bayview to look at us and be able to call on us to be able to help the city. And I know that yesterday we spoke communication around agency officials as well as what's happening on the ground in your community becomes a big issue. Can you speak a little bit about communication? Right, well, and, and on the first, um, I think the first step when we talk about communication is, again, communication within, within the community within that neighborhood, within that area, how you as residents are gonna be communicating with one another. Because again, you are your first responders, period. Um, another piece in terms of, of communication is understanding within that organization who is really speaking for the neighborhood and not having multiple people within the community not being on the same script, so to speak. Um, you have to, the messaging is very important. And in a post-disaster environment, the last thing you need is chaos within your own community. Um, it really sets the tone to folks that you need to come help you and if it's chaos, 
people can look over you and go to other neighborhoods where there's no chaos. You have to make it easy for people to help you. And one of the ways to do that is to understand as a community how you're going to be co communicating with one another, how you're going to organize yourselves in terms of sharing that message, how are you going to be able to truly articulate what the needs are in your neighborhood? You can't have a list of 100. I mean, you really need to think about this. And you need to be spot on, everyone speaking to the same script, and really uh, being able to harness then the volunteers and the support systems that will come. And the bottom line is you're going to need resources. You're going to need money to flow. And when corporations and foundations and faith-based communities are determining who they're going to help, it's going to make a big difference when you give them, you know, when you set the tone for how um, your neighborhood or your community is communicating, but also focused on its own recovery. Because you're the Calvary. There's no Calvary coming. That's the first thing we understood. You know, we thought, hey, streets were going to be paved with gold. No, that was total BS. We understood quickly that we were the Calvary. And not only that, that we were the world's greatest experts on Broadmoor, on our community. So you have to own it. You have to plan accordingly. And, and one last thing uh, about this piece. You know, I heard a rumor, and this was, um, let me see, we started organizing January of 06. And at that time, you know, I kind of heard a rumor there were certain folks in the neighborhood that were trying to kind of do their own thing, you know. Someone started a website here and, you know, wait a minute, what if the BIA cannot get this thing done, you know, really what's going on? And so I really didn't pay much attention to that because at the end of the day, you have to stay focused, right, on the community, on the people, on the recovery. And so, long story short, those folks who are trying to do their own thing, it never evolved. And it will never evolve if the community is truly organized. And meaning that the trust is there, and once folks saw the BIA and the leadership was doing a good job, they joined right on in. And you know what? They didn't make any sound, any noise at all. They would just kind of wait, wait, see, wait, see. But leadership is very important, and you can never underestimate. We, we talk about resiliency, but really, I talk about I really leadership. We throw that word around, but it really, really means something. And that's what you need to be building in your community now, because it's going to be what is going to get you through, um, through recovery. So you can really then see how resilient you are. <laughs> exactly. I'm happy that you actually speak about leadership because to build resilient communities, it takes community leaders, leaders from across all facets, the school districts, your, lo your, your local authorities, the faith-based community, the homeowners, the low-income um, residents that live in low-income housing. It takes leaders amongst all, and that's where I believe all of us are alike with our resilient communities is trying to focus on who are the leaders in our community, not who are the politicians or who's the executive directors. We don't use titles because leaders could be the, I tell our, our persons living with disabilities who come to our community room that leaders are people like you because there's a job, there's a place for everybody if we're trying to rebuild our community. No, it's true. And you always have to expand your scope of inclusion. And you will also see in post-disaster folks that you haven't seen before. People that you really didn't know as much as you try in the pre-disaster mode. There will be folks that step up, and then you'll have folks even on your board. I had the, this is what, what happened to me. Now I had a guy named Hal Rourke who was a resident in the neighborhood. And Hal said, well, you know, he wanted to get involved in the recovery. 
and I had a couple of my board members. Who is he? He was nowhere to be found, you know. Where, what is he trying to do? And I said, hey, you know, you have to build on momentum and you have to always, always expand the scope of inclusion. And you can never underestimate what someone has to offer. And the titles, your apps, they mean nothing. It's boots on the ground, it's people, you know, fresh, ready to hit the ground. And one thing that you do have here in San Francisco, you have a mayor who was boots on the ground before being mayor. That means a lot. And when I think about it, when I was in Broadmoor in New Orleans, Daniel showing up, same personality, attitude he has today was in Broadmoor. I'm like, man, calm down. No way. No way, no how. But he came and he, his spirit uplifted the people of the city and in our neighborhood. And Mayor Lee now, Ed Lee, is going to Home Depot, you know, with, with one of my board members, Ernie Osteen, who, who is now deceased. But buying lawnmowers and, and, and um, you know, uh, what do you call it? I don't even know, all kind of stuff, you know, cutting trees and moving debris and you name it. So the city of San Francisco was a real, real partner um, with the Broadmoor community and me on the ground post-disaster. And it is such a blessing to have leadership in government that understands what disaster is about, but more importantly, what being prepared is all about. So that's something that we didn't have in New Orleans uh, post-disaster. Government was nowhere to be found on every level. And Mr. Randy said, FEMA, yeah, he's right about that. S uh, steamroller, I think FEMA has learned a lot. You know, since then, they really have, but that's what we all, right, we're all, we are all learning. But I remember, you know, volunteers, we gutted our school, our public school, salvaged what we felt was salvageable. And then three days later, here comes FEMA, removing what we thought we were going to salvage. But again, this was several years after the, the disaster. So again, I can't stress to you enough, you are the first responders in your community. You will be. And I also would like to say that we have to, this is what I'm starting to think about, is that we, we have to frame the disasters, I think, a little bit differently because it's not just the natural. We also have to think about the man-made, in which Katrina was man-made with the levees failing, but again, the hurricane had something to do with that. You can't overlook it. But, but with, um, you know, with mass shootings, with bombings, you know, all of these things we have to, for, for me, I'm starting to think about these are forms of disasters that we have to also be prepared for. And you can think about, like you said, your civic institutions, your schools, um, uh, assets that would need to be brought back first. But when disaster happens, we don't know. It could even happen and destroy you know, those assets that you were planning on utilizing in that environment. So in other words, make your contingency plan fluid not base it around any one entity or one area because you never know where the disaster is. And you, you hit it right on there, Felicia, because um, in, in, in New Orleans, post-Katrina, we would say in Broadmoor, uh, you know, people say, oh, you have to be flexible. We said, no, uh, uh you have to be fluid because flexible is too rigid. So fluid is exactly right because you have to be able to move through the changes that you will, you know, that you will be going through. And you, you know, 50% of something is better than 100% of nothing. I can't stress that enough. It's not the Taj Mahal, you know, that you're trying to bring back. It's the people. And so um, we have to be reminded of that. I like when you said we were the professionals of Broadmoor, the people who live within the community. I also wanted to, um, oh, talk about how you, fr um, what exactly did you mean when you say frame the disaster? And 
from what approach? In terms of, of, of framing, now there's two areas. It's the community being able to articulate its real needs. Um, you know, based on the disaster that has occurred. Mm -hmm. um, and framing it in a way that people who will be responding to your needs could actually understand and be able to facilitate those resources or getting those resources to you. Um, the, the framing is, is, is just extremely important. I think in the post-Katrina disaster in regards to framing, it was framed all wrong. Um, it was, you know, you were made to believe that it was just, you know, one, only people of color that, you know, there were even books, cited in books right now. Um, and even where you have reporters who were on the ground, we've learned 10 years later, they were lying. You know, people, they were not snipers in the Superdome. You know, people weren't killing one another. They weren't raping babies in the Superdome. Um, you know, but this is how Katrina was framed. And based on how the disaster was framed, it had an impact on the recovery, the response to the, rec you know, to the, the, the needs and the recovery. Um, and, and one example of that is since people were, you know, uh, labeled as prostitutes and drug addicts and those who did not evacuate, um, it really set the tone, I believe, even at the state level when they started to determine or adopt policies on how resources would hit the ground. And those um, uh, elected officials at the time or policymakers at the time spent so much of their energy on trying to figure out, you know, how do we stop fraud to the, way, to the point that they screw people. And, and an example of that is the state program, the Road Home Program, which was the program designed to get the disaster recovery money for rebuilding to homeowners and to residents. And New Orleans had majority renters. And so one of the policies that was adopted right after was that although the renters were the majority, resources went to those who had homes. So we skipped over the people that were the largest population. They were renters, but they got the, the least amount of the dollars. And so again, how you frame disaster mm. is going to determine, I believe, how policies will be set and how they will be implemented in that post-disaster recovery. It's very important because people were screwed. And even 10 years later, you can easily look at who were screwed. And then attitudes kind of change. You know, oh, people making decisions, oh, well, they didn't rebuild fast enough. Well, they got screwed. You know, or what's taking them so long? Well, contractor fraud. You know, 80-year-old woman paid $25,000 to have her home gutted. That's fraud. So again, framing is everything. And you, leaders on the ground, you have to take ownership of how your disaster will be framed. And you frame it for yourselves. You frame it for your partners who will be coming in, because those are the folks that will be helping you, I think, first. But I tell you, with the government leadership that you have, I know the outcomes will be far greater than what we experienced in New Orleans. And I think we have all learned a lesson from that. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And this conversation. Thank you. If you'd like to learn more about the Neighborhood Empowerment Network and programs such as the Empower Communities Program, as well as about all the amazing partners that we have working together every day to build a more resilient future for our communities, visit EmpowerSF.org. Sign up for our newsletter and stay in touch.